Artificial intelligence will completely transform our world. But what is AI? Why will it affect you? And how can you and your business survive and thrive through the AI revolution? Welcome to AI and You. Here is your host, author, speaker, and futurist, Peter Scott. Hello and welcome to episode 218. You know, when you think about it, virtually everything that's difficult about getting computers to do work for us is in getting them to understand our question or request and in our understanding their answer. Suppose, for instance, you want your digital assistant, like Siri, to give you a reminder to go buy a turkey five days before Thanksgiving each year. That's a trivial calculation to subtract five days off the fourth Thursday in November or the second Monday in October and create a small data structure. Actually doing the work takes microseconds, but getting the computer to understand that takes either a trained developer to create a small program in a high-level language or a sophisticated natural language processing system to understand general complex time relationships like that. And as far as I know, Siri and Alexa and the other digital assistants can't understand that particular request yet because it's just a little bit more complicated than what they've been trained to do. So while it takes you 10 seconds to voice the request, it takes a developer much, much, much longer than that to write that program. And that's where our bottleneck is in getting computers to do what we want. So while there are a few things we can ask a computer to do where it takes longer to run the program than it does to create the program, like modeling the Earth's climate or rendering a CGI movie, the vast majority of the time, the real work lies in the interface between the computer and humans. Whether we navigate that through writing a program to solve a problem or in writing a program to understand the natural language expressions of lots of problems. And that's where today's guest comes in. Sophie Kleber, based in Berlin, is the UX, that's User Experience, Director for the Future of Work at Google, and an expert in ethical AI and future human-machine interaction. She deeply understands the emotional development of automated assistance, artificial intelligence, and physical spaces. Sophie develops technology that enables individuals to be their best selves. Before joining Google, Sophie held the Global Executive Creative Director role at HUGE, collaborating with brands like IKEA and Thomson Reuters. She holds an MA in Communication Design and an MBA in Product Design and is a Fulbright Fellow. As you can imagine, AI radically disrupts the entire field of how we get computers to understand us. So let's get right into the interview. Sophie Kleber, it's a pleasure to welcome you to AI and You. And you have a really big title, UX, that's User Experience Director for the Future of Work. That's big. I'm going to take that at face value and ask really big questions because that's just how we roll on this show. So I want to talk about what the impact of AI is on how user interfaces are built. But probably more importantly, what the design of those interfaces is. And I've, I'll have more specific questions about that as we go along. But as a starting point, perhaps you could talk about that. Yeah, I personally think that there's two directions that AI is going or can go. The one direction is the AI that you don't really see and you don't really feel, but that makes any product better. That's the integrated, I'm going to call it artificial intelligence, but you can also just call it smarter automation, right? When you try and select a meeting and the computer would give you a meeting time that works for all parties because the computer knows the time zones, that's a form of intelligence that is integrated and that we don't really think about because the product is just smarter. And then we have that AI that we now talk about so much that actually shows up in its own product with its own interface, which most of the time is a voice interface or a conversational interface. And that's where things get interesting and also very tricky because 
It's the first time in human history that the computer refers to itself as I. And when we go back in science fiction, we have some examples where the computer doesn't do it, right? Star Trek computer doesn't say I. And some examples where the computer does, Hull says I. And that has been a deliberate choice. And that's where UX design comes in. Because there are people behind this who design the interface that this artificial intelligence shows up with. And they make these deliberate choices about, does the computer say I? Does the computer have a certain personality? So in these scenarios, when it comes to this purest form of AI, interaction design or user experience design really comes in and helps define the personality, but more importantly, should actually come in and define the relationship that we are aiming to have with this AI. Because you can imagine an AI can be a friend, an AI can be a tutor, an AI can be an assistant. These are very different. And these are very different relationships and how the computer shows up in those relationships is very different. And we have to be deliberate about, otherwise we fall into very difficult relationship traps. And the reason why I call them traps is because we as humans actually have difficulty when something behaves slightly humanoid, we fill in the gaps. So we have difficulty distinguishing that it's still a machine when it behaves humanoid. And it's called the CASA effect, computers as social actors, or the ELISA effect. ELISA was the first chatbot kind of ever developed, and people immediately started telling it deep secrets because it had this humanoid quality to it. So therefore, I think there's a very important moment for user experience right now at this interface to define what kind of relationship do we want to keep innately to us humans and what can AI as in its purest form then really fill in? Is there even a role in our lived experience for that pure form of a conversation with a machine? Well, I love how this is going. I do want to interject here because I should have said earlier that your current position and the role title that we described is at Google and that you're not speaking on behalf of Google in anything that we talk about here. That said, what you're saying about our relationship with the computer here seems to bring up a fundamental dichotomy, a dilemma that we, on the one hand, want to relate to it as personal, otherwise it's alien, and that's unsettling. So the uncanny valley comes into play here. On the other hand, it isn't human. And if we anthropomorphize it, hey, I said it right. If we anthropomorphize it, then we run the risks of treating something as what it isn't. Do you see a way of reconciling that paradox? Yeah, and you're right. I've been researching this field way before I worked at Google. And I think this field is much larger than a couple of companies. I think this is really a, a direction that we all user experience designers and basically everyone in technology should think about. Because you're right, there's a beauty and an undeniable advancement when technology for the first time is usable on our own terms. Our most innate interface is language. And before that, we had to learn a computer language, right? In the very early days, we really had to learn a computer language. We had to type it in and program it. Then we had to learn interfaces, which was still a learning process, right? Something that was flat and we tried to work through that. And now we actually have for the first time that the computer can communicate to us on our own terms. That is progress and that is beautiful progress. Now, what do you do? How do you strike that balance so that it doesn't become the her scenario, right? But we all just don't need any other relationships anymore. And I, I do believe that some of the things that we see happening, right, when we talk about asocial behavior in our society, we had a lot of conversations about that post-pandemic, people who freak out about incidents that were really not freak out worthy. One can wonder where that comes from. I mean, there's a UNESCO report from 2019 that talks about the difficulty when these interfaces are female, are subservient, are this weird mix between assistant and friend, and really kind of model the waters between these different things. So we have to wonder 
what else is there and what evolution is there. Now, there's a couple of ways that people in the field and scholars think this could go. One is the idea of actually going backwards a step and making sure that it's clear that these voices are not human. So think cartoon, think the direction of going a little bit different, or think, you know, kind of Tin Man, so that it comes back to this idea that the computer doesn't refer to itself as I, but really is a little more command and an answer. That's one idea. And they can all go together, of course, as well. But the next idea is that we actually come back to what a true digitized interface is so good at, which is multimodality. So instead, right now, we're we're basically at a very rudimentary way um, of interacting with a very intelligent machine. It's chat, right? Now we're starting to come into the idea when you say, show me, it actually shows. Or when you say, play this, it actually plays. So to go back into the multimodality, and that requires much more multimodal real-world interfaces, right? That I go into a room and that room is outfitted in a way that it can actually react versus thinking just about screens. I think that is a very interesting way because that's really something that a computer is actually better at than just a conversation. And the last one, fortunately, unfortunately, is this idea that they become the, I'm going to call it AIs, I'm going to call them assistants, they become very personalized. So they really, that is the her scenario, right? They really go into what you specifically require, how you want to be spoken to, and what is good for you. And they develop with you through your life, essentially. None of these scenarios are completely off the table. Though I do think that the first one is a trickier one because people don't like to go backwards, right? So the second and the third is going to be really interesting how we as humans adapt to that and what happens to us and what happens to our human-to-human relationships when we basically can have a humanoid machine at our service at any given time, at any moment. Mm. Replica is an example I like to use when I think a little bit more about the dark side. I think replica slogan is always there for you, always on your side. And that is, I think, where everything goes wrong because human relationships, the fabric of human relationships is the beauty of connection, of community. The idea that friendship begets friendship and that people who you talk to, people who you know best, they also set you straight. They rub against you. Their reactions are not what you expect. And that's how you learn. And that's how you learn to be social. Networks develop through human connections, right? Humans you know will connect you with other people. And none of that is part of the relationship that we form or can form at this moment with an AI. So it's really a stripped down version of a kind of pondering to yourself or pondering to whatever you chose your avatar to be. And that's not necessarily a healthy way to lead a relationship. And, well, you have put so much on the table here. And just reacting to that last point, you say that those kind of relationships aren't here with AI yet, but there are some people who are attempting to do that, some people who are forming those kind of relationships or think they have with replica, with artificial boyfriend slash girlfriend. There's a lot of news of these things. For some reason, a lot of it seems to come out of Japan, but it's not confined to there. Of people who would say that they have a serviceable, intimate relationship with an AI. What's your reaction to that? Yeah, I think just because it's possible one has to ask, is that the desired life I want to live? And I think a couple of interesting things. You mentioned Japan. Japan has long been studied as a country that has a loneliness crisis and as a country that has such a strong social code that is so confining that especially younger people tend to opt out completely rather than succumb to the social code. So what I'm saying is oftentimes when people escape it's a form of escapism, I think. And when people escape into these types of relationships, there might be something else underlying. And if we can just escape, we tend to ignore the problem. 
there's ideas about, there's conversations around, well, older people, when they are lonely, shouldn't they just have like a chatbot or an AI chat to combat that loneliness? And I think that makes it very easy for society to completely ignore that there's actually a problem. So I don't believe in these fixes. I don't believe that it's better to have a chatbot than to talk to no one. I believe it's our job as a society to make sure that people are integrated. And as, you know, in this case, I would go on a limb and say it's Japan's job to actually tackle the problem of a very rigid social code that doesn't fit some of the population in that country. But I think that sometimes it's also phases in life, right? I've heard of cases that have, you know, had replica boyfriends or girlfriends after a bad breakup and they just wanted to be held. But I think what we really have to think about here is the play with human emotion. And I've thought a lot about, a long time I've thought about emotive AI and the idea when machines can actually read emotions, the whole effective computing field. So when machines can basically detect human emotions and then also emote themselves, that is a layer that is very, very interesting when it comes to manipulation because our emotions are very personal. And Replica is a good example. I think it was last year. They shut down a lot of the erotica functionality. I think that a couple of lawsuits, I think one in Italy, that they actually had to close down some of the more intimate features or intimate things you could do with your avatar. And people, people's emotions were hurt. People really were deeply offended and deeply affected because their girlfriend, boyfriend wouldn't react the same way and they couldn't. And being at the mercy of a company with something as important as human relationships is really something that I would think twice about. Well, again, so much to look at here. And we're talking about this digital companion aspect of AI here. I want to elevate this to the higher level of human computer interaction and relationships because that's where these things have actually started to overlap recently. You talked about her a few times, and that was a scenario that was evoked by the Chat GPT Omni release earlier this year in a, I would say, cringeworthy demonstration of people interacting with an AI that was just gushing all over them with a very good imitation of Scarlett Johansson's voice and doing everything but saying, my, how strong you are, which was exactly the take that The Daily Show had mm -hmm. on it when they took it on, I thought, quite expertly. And yet, user interfaces span everything from this digital companion to spreadsheets. And the GPT Omni release is where this overlap starts to happen because the way that we ask a computer a question is the whole difficult thing, the whole flux capacitor of computers, because virtually everything we ask a computer to do is really easy for it to do. The hard part is getting it to understand the question and for us to understand the answer. That's a user interface. And now a lot of that difficulty, that time-consuming translation is obviated by just being able to talk to it, say what you want, and a large language model figures it out. But the large language model sounds like a human being. And with OpenAI, they went overboard in doing that. And now it brings up all these relationship issues. But I really liked your idea of have it look like something that isn't necessarily human. But if I think about things that aren't human, but still have this quality of sentience, consciousness, self-awareness, I have to go to fiction. I have to think like, okay, shall we build a user interface that's like Bugs Bunny? Would that be fit for purpose? Right. <laughs> Any thoughts about how we could do something that has the right kind of interface for dealing with something that can imitate consciousness without us mistaking it for being human? I have a couple of thoughts. I want to pick up on what you said about the chat GPT launch because I do think that it is mind-boggling that in 2024, this happens when we had the same conversation 10 years prior. We had the same conversation when Amazon Alexa came out. Siri, in fact, was the first one who set the standard for a flirtatious female voice that's kind of sassy and so forth. And to come back 10 years later, and have that same 
cringeworthy problem on the table again. I'm going to roll the drum here for user research. There is such a thing as asking users what they want and how they want to be treated. We have kind of completely missed the boat because in the secrecy of Silicon Valley, we don't like to talk to users before we have a big bang launch. So I think the idea of we now miss the boat to ask people if a machine could talk, what kind of relationship would you like to have with it? But Clifford Nass is actually one who like, I really admire in the research that he's done way prior to, or a couple of years prior definitely, to the Alexa launch, in which he's asked thousands of thousands of people and none of them said they want to have a relationship with the machine. It was just not a thing. So to ask the question, should this actually appear sentient? I'm coming back to the Star Trek computer. The Star Trek computer, when you say Star computer, first of all, it's talked to as computer right? It doesn't have a name. It's not like, hey, commander, blah, blah, blah. It's computer. And when you talk to computer and you say, computer, give me this, or computer, turn up the temperature or whatnot, it does not come back. It's a little chime in the interface that confirms that this has happened. Only when it doesn't happen, the computer says, cannot fulfill command or something, but it never says, I cannot fulfill command. So I really question the idea, should this actually appear sentient. Is that important for us as humans to get it to do what it needs to do? Or are we running down a track? Because, you know, humans have this problem of the pendulum of innovation, I call it. The pendulum pendulum of what? Pendulum of innovation. That's what I call it. So the pendulum swings in one side to one side, really hard to say what technology can do. And we have a tendency to do things just because we can. And that's beautiful because that's how innovation happens. But then on the other side of the pendulum is what users really want and what people really want. And at some point, it pendles out in the middle. We're finding ourselves in that moment with social media, right? We built all of this crazy addictive technology because we could. And we all consumed it because we're like, oh, wow, that's hitting some dopamine that I haven't felt before. And now we're going back to, hey, what do people actually want? And we're going to swing somewhere into the middle. And I think that we're going to have to have a moment with humanoid appearing computers as well, that the pendulum swings really hard now, right? One person fulfilled their her fantasy, right? Great. If that was what you set out to, I say you succeeded. You built her, right? But is that what we really want? And now we have to ask ourselves. And I do believe that while we talk a lot about ChatGPT and these really big large language models and really big kind of AI products, the use cases, the actual usefulness is yet to be found. And when we talk about the actual usefulness, we come back to really simplistic use cases like, oh, it can summarize an email. Yeah, no joke. We don't need all of that data power and for that. So I think we're in a bottoms up, technology up innovation cycle right now. So we throw out this technology. This is what it can do. And now we have to find the use cases. That's always a little bit harder than going the other way around where we say we have real user problems here. And we're now going to find technology solutions to fill those gaps. It seems that we're heading towards a conflict here that my experience of the large language models is that I get the most out of them the more I treat them as being human. Possibly a human reflection of myself, but to perform some unwarranted psychology. But when I employ the skills that I learned for being a communicator of resolving ambiguity, avoiding misunderstandings, establishing context, that's when I get the most out of it. That is prompt engineering in a nutshell. And it requires this back and forth. It's impossible for me to do that without thinking that I'm talking to a human being or something very human-like in the process. I can't do that. I don't know if that's something where enough training might make a difference. And especially because relating to it that way is productive. It gets me what I want faster. And also, Is it valuable for computers to understand emotions? The whole field of emotion AI is based on this. 
I get frustrated sometimes when I'm talking to Alexa and she doesn't understand me, or I am annoyed that in the conversation, she doesn't understand that I am frustrated about something else. Whereas a human being would and would be like, oh, I, okay, I'll, I'll back off. <laughs> You're, you've got something going on here. Do we want to aim for that? Do we want computers to be emotion aware? And if they are, then doesn't that make us relate to them as though they were human even more? I think the questions you bring up are so interesting because it does absolutely and very accurately describe the dilemma that we are finding ourselves in. We have gone that route. And there's a reason why we have gone that route because it is, again, the easiest form of communication for us is a way that we as humans communicate that is through language, but that is even more through all the nuances that we express. And that includes emotions, right? There's about 40 markers of your emotions in language. So when you speak, 40 different things like how fast you speak, how slow you speak, how high-pitched, how low-pitched you speak, whether in a sentence your tonality goes up in the end or down, all of these things are markers for emotion. They were pretty easy to detect, to decode and then detect. So when we go down the route of saying, we've developed something that can understand us uniquely as humans, and the question, it does beg the question, should we actually stop here? Because we're not fully understood by typing in a couple of words. If we really want to be fully understood, we have to bring in the emotions, right? And then a machine could react. Years and years ago, I developed a framework for exactly that dilemma. And I said, it has to be user-driven. That is the first thing. So on the one axis, you have, what is the intention of the user? And in that intention, is it beneficial for the user to have their emotions be part of the equation? So let's say I want to buy a car. I, as a user, will probably say, it is not beneficial to me if you as a machine know my emotions, because then you can play me, right? There's a little poker in the car. And well, that's exactly what car dealers do. Exactly, yes. But that's, if I want that, I go to a car dealer and not to a machine. <laughs> and then on the other end of the spectrum, you have the idea that maybe I want to quit smoking, right? Or maybe I want to better myself in some way of my well-being. And in that case, my emotions play a big role, and it would be very beneficial for me if you understood my emotions. So that's the one axis. And on the other axis, we have that idea of what is the company's intention and what could go wrong for a company as well, right? Very early on, there were these examples of, I think Hershey's got like brought out a gimmick that said, when you go up to a machine and you smile, you get a Hershey's kiss. That is a Pavlovsh dog. That is not emotion. That has nothing to do with like whatever we're trying to do here. But these were some examples of like early like emotive play. And I think a company has to be very, very careful about what could the damage be to the brand, to the person, and to everything in between as well. And then I would say if the user doesn't want, like there's kind of like three different gradations of how the machine could react. So if the user doesn't want any emotions at play and the company doesn't have any business in that space, then you just don't do it, right? If the user, you know, has a benefit from having the emotions read, but the company is still in a very kind of like mechanical business, then the company has the opportunity to act like a machine. That means... For example, there's a lot of research with cars, right? And if I get mad or if it gets dangerous for me with the emotions that I exhibit in the cockpit, the machine can shut down or the machine can take over. Things where it's beneficial to me, but it still reacts completely like a machine. It's just a switch. Similar with when you call a machine or you call a company and it's a machine, there are moments where when they detect that you get mad, they route you faster to a human. So these are simple switchboard ideas but your emotions are being considered in the if-then equation. I don't think I've been on one of those calls yet because I get mad and it doesn't help. <laughs> operator, operator, operator. <laughs> <It> never helps. <laughs> <laughs> but then you go a little bit further and then there's two more gradations. The one is the one where we say, okay, feedback the emotions to me. That to me is kind of the big hero six, right? Big hero six is a movie that I love because it has this like real caregiving robot in there. And the caregiving robot has multiple scenes where 
It feeds back the emotions, but it really does just that. And that gives a person full control over do I do something with that or not, but maybe a little bit more awareness, right? There was a early prototype for traders. It was a, a wristband and a little bowl that when they got aroused, because biodermic can really not measure very much emotion, but it can measure arousal. So when they got aroused, the bowl would get like a fiery color. So when you were working through the day and you would realize that you you get excited, that bowl would show that to you. Did nothing else. Didn't shut down the machine, didn't lock you out of your trading account, just did that. And that's an interesting step as well. And then the last step is that example I said, I want to better myself and I need basically the machine to not only feedback me, but also help me with my behavioral change. Then you're actually in that space where you might give a machine full permission to not only read your emotions, but also in some subtle ways, alter your emotions. Mm. But all of that has to be user-driven and all of that has to also be user-revocable at any given point. And that's the end of the first half of the interview, next half, next week. For those of you who weren't familiar with a few references there, Hal was the computer in the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey, and Eliza was a landmark, early, very early, chatbot, written to emulate a Rogerian psychotherapist. We've talked about both of them extensively on the show before. Sophie opened up a whole new set of possibilities for me of relating to our new AIs, not as human, but nevertheless as something we think of as sentient, conscious even, because it helps us get what we want out of it. I'm still thinking about the possibility of it being Bugs Bunny. Your Disney's and Paramount's have got to be thinking about monetization potential there. We talked about the announcement of GPT-4 Omni in this part of the interview and how the demonstrations were taking such a step backwards in gender stereotyping. I called that out on this show in episode 207, mostly by referring to the Daily Show's take on it, where Desi Lydic did the most expert job of skewering the male fantasy fulfillment that was on display. You might want to go listen to that episode if you haven't already. In today's news, ripped from the headlines about AI, UNESCO is now calling for formal guidelines for the use of AI in courts and tribunals. UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, published its final draft of guidelines aimed at helping ensure use of AI technologies by courts and tribunals aligns with the fundamental principles of justice, human rights, and the rule of law. The organization is seeking feedback on the guidelines from legal professionals and the public through September 5th, before releasing the final version in November. While AI tools can be helpful in the judicial system, they can also, quote, undermine human rights, such as fair trial and due process, access to justice and effective remedy, privacy and data protection, equality before the law and non-discrimination, as well as judicial values, such as impartiality, independence and accountability, according to a document introducing the draft guidelines. Begin quote again. Moreover, the misuse of AI systems may undermine society's trust in the judicial system. AI tools are not a substitute for qualified legal reasoning, human judgment, or tailored legal advice. End quote. Well, so far they aren't. Can you imagine a day when we prefer their judgment to that of flawed humans? Not saying we're there yet, not saying I want that, just saying I can imagine it happening. Next week, we'll conclude the interview with Sophie Kleber, when we'll talk about how she got into the user experience field, the emergence of a third paradigm of user interfaces, the future of smart homes, privacy, large language models coming to consumer devices, and brain-computer interfaces. That's next week on AI and You. Until then, remember, no matter how much computers learn how to do, it's how we come together as humans that matters. That's all for this episode of AI and You. Please leave a rating and comment and share with your friends. Get the book Artificial Intelligence and You and see more videos and articles 
at AINU.net. That's A-I-A-N-D-Y-O-U dot net, where you can also send us your questions. Thank you for listening.